Good morning. Thank you for being here. So just a, a, a quick disclaimer, but I'm here with, but from BioRad, but I'm not an employee of BioRad. I'm not here to push their products, but I'm here to talk about um, the HIV testing. All right, HIV, as we all know, it's the etiologic agent of AIDS, but AIDS is just one stage of HIV infection. Right? The virus originally is believed to have evolved from a simian immunodeficiency virus from chimpanzees, transmitted by you know, sexual contact, body fluid transmission. The virus is a retrovirus of the lentivirus uh, families, and it has double-stranded RNA, and the RNA, as you can see, I think, on the next slide, it's encoded by a protein called P24, and P24 will come into play when we talk more about the actual testing for HIV. There are other proteins. The outer protein is known as GP120, and, GP, and part of the protein that actually um, spans the viral membrane or the viral envelope is called GP41. We, we call HIV-1, but just dealing with HIV-1 is almost like saying there's cancer. There are many different types of cancer. There are different types of HIV. HIV can be broadly subclassified into HIV-1 and HIV-2, and HIV-1 can be subdivided, as you can see on this slide, into group M, so-called major group. Group O is so-called other type of HIV um, uh, uh, virions and group N and P are extremely rare types. But if you look at group M, you'll notice that it's subdivided into a number of other groups. These are so-called clades. And in the US and North America, uh, the main HIV that we have is clade B. So most of the lab tests available are designed to detect antibodies. They'll detect them to HIV 1, 2, and group O, but they're really designed in the US to go for clade B virus. And here again, the type, the various uh, outlines you can see, type N and type P are extremely rare. HIV-2 is similar to HIV-1, but the disease it causes isn't quite the same. It's a little bit less virulent, uh, primarily in West Africa. You know, the state of Ohio, we've had one case of HIV-2, as an example. In California, in Southern California, New York City, there's more HIV-2 in the country than we have in Ohio. I apologize, I'm not sure what it is in the Dallas area here. HIV, like all viruses, needs to take over a cell to actually divide and grow. So HIV, the GP120 on the outside of the HIV um, virion, will actually bind to a protein we call CD4 on the surface of our T cells. It's also present on some cells in the central nervous system. And it, that's necessary but not sufficient for HIV to enter a cell. HIV must also bind to a second receptor, and there are two of these. One is called CCR5, one is called CXCR4. And different forms of HIV may bind to different receptor, different chemokine receptors, CCR5 or CXCR4. This comes into play with one of the newer drugs called Miravirac, which actually blocks CCR5. So if you have a virus that actually uses CCR5 to bind to the cell, that drug can be used to block that virus from entering a cell. This is a picture that gives you a rough idea of the size of the HIV virion versus the size of a T cell. HIV, the disease course, as you can see here, the blue line is the number of CD4 cells, T helper cells, that we can actually monitor in the bloodstream. The red line is the actual amount of virus that's present. So you can see that goes up initially, comes down and forms a latent period, which may last for years between the time when someone's infected and when they actually um, develop AIDS, which is the third stage or the later stage of HIV infection. And the CD4 cells are destroyed, and these are the T helper cells. These are the cells that are really responsible for getting the immune system going. So the lack of, T, of CD4 cells is the reason why you develop the severe immune deficiency associated with HIV infection. And a variety of reasons uh, are believed to occur as to why you lose CD4 cells. One is direct virus infection. The virus infects CD4 cells, multiplies in the CD4 cells, and eventually will destroy that cell. But the virus can also induce the cell to enter apoptosis, or programmed cell death, almost cellular suicide. Everybody likes numbers. In the U.S., it's believed there are about 1.2 million people infected with the U.S. The CDC guesses about 25% don't know they're infected. I really don't know how they come up with that statistic. Um, it, but, and the other thing I find interesting about this is when AIDS first hit in the mid-1980s, the CDC at that time was saying, we probably have about a million people in the U.S. who have this disease. Well, I don't believe we haven't really changed that much in the last 30 years as far as the number of people um, particularly now that people are surviving virtually indefinitely with HIV. So there may be more than there were then. I don't know if one of those figures was right, right or wrong. But a problem we have in the U.S. in trying to educate people about HIV 
is that there's still the stigma that HIV is a disease of homosexuals. No, HIV is a sexually transmitted disease that just happened to enter the U.S. in the homosexual population. Worldwide, most of the infections are heterosexual, heterosexual transmission, and in the U.S., one of the fastest growing ways of transmitting HIV is through heterosexual contact. This kind of shows you in the U.S., still about half the infections are associated with male-to-male -male sexual transmission, but worldwide, almost three-quarters of the infections are associated with um, heterosexual transmission. This kind of shows you from um, the mid-80s through 2013, which is the, the latest, latest data I could find, uh, the incidence of HIV and the death. The um, gold line, the kind of orangish line, I, I guess, is the diagnosis of HIV. The blue line is the death. So you can see overall about half the people diagnosed with HIV have passed away. And that seems to be relatively constant, although those lines are getting a little bit closer together as people are surviving longer now with HIV infection. The definition of HIV and AIDS, as I said, AIDS is a stage of HIV infection, and the CDC has guidelines as far as how we diagnose HIV and how we classify it. And these stages allow for proper monitoring. So the criteria for a confirmed case, as you can see, has both laboratory and clinical evidence. And you can see from the laboratory on the slide that there must be a positive screening test with a supplemental test. So we're going to talk, when we talk about the diagnosis, we'll talk about a two-test algorithm. And if you have a newborn who you want to screen for HIV infection, antibody tests become relatively useless because antibody tests pick up IgG and IgM but don't differentiate. So if mom's positive, baby's going to have IgG that cross the placenta, so baby will be positive regardless of whether or not it's infected. So because of that, we want to do molecular tests to actually detect the presence of the virus if we're trying to do neonatal HIV diagnosis. skip over that one. This is another way to help diagnose HIV infection is to look at the number of CD4 cells that they have. In an adult, the normal number, it may depend on the laboratory, but it's approximately 500 CD4 cells per microliter. And if you have less than 200, you're actually diagnosed as having a a AIDS if you have HIV infection. For a newborn, though, that number, is, the number of CD4 cells a newborn has is much higher than an adult, so a value of 750 is used as a cutoff for AIDS in a newborn. Detecting either the presence of the virus or the antibody to the virus can be fairly difficult at times due to the fact that from the, between the time of infection until the time either the virus or antibody is detected is not hours or minutes, it's days to weeks. So somebody may be infected and it may be up to a couple of weeks now with the fourth generation testing before we know they're infected. And this is referred to as a window period where we actually have the, uh, ant the virus present but no antibody is detectable. So why do we do HIV laboratory tests? We're all laboratorians in this room, at least most likely. Well, first of all, for diagnosis. We want to find out, is someone infected with HIV? And also to protect the blood or organ supply. And that's how HIV antibody testing really got started in the mid-1980s, was testing not to diagnose HIV infection or diagnose AIDS, but to actually protect the blood supply. And where this became an issue was these tests were awfully sensitive to protect the blood supply. And if we threw out a couple of extra units, that were false positives just to protect the blood supply, that's good. But when they, we started to apply that test to diagnosis, and all of a sudden we're not throwing out a few extra units, we're telling people they're HIV positive when they're really not. And that caused issues. So the, the initial problems with the sensitivity of the early generation test had to be rectified. So to diagnose HIV then in the laboratory, we can either look for the presence of the virus or one of the viral proteins, or we can look for the body's response to the virus, the antibody that, the, that we make. For direct virus detection, there are a number of tests that are available. You can do culture if you have a P3 facility and really want to grow HIV in your laboratory. I don't want to do that, but <laughs> if anyone wants to do it, you're welcome to it. P24 antigen testing by ELISA methods has been available for many years as an individual test that's tending to go away because P24 antigen testing is included in the fourth generation of HIV testing. Um, qualitative PCR, either DNA or RNA, has often been used for neonatal diagnosis. And this qualitative PCR now is also recommended as part of the fourth generation algorithm. Which, and many labs following HIV patients will do quantitative PCR testing, um, so-called HIV viral load, as one of the tests we use to monitor patients who are infected with HIV. 
the qualitative RNA detection is often used in the blood bank. We can test pooled units to see if there's any HIV present in any of those in that population. If it is, then we can test units individually to see which ones are truly positive. The assay used, there's only one assay that's approved for this as a qualitative um, PCR test, is the GenProbe Aptima assay. For antibody testing, we have this two-test algorithm. In which we have screening and confirmatory testing. And historically, the principal screening method has been an ELISA test. More recently, so-called chemiluminescent test, more automated testing has become available. And historically, also, the principal confirming method has been the so-called Western blot assay. So we screen with an ELISA. If it's positive, we retest and duplicate, then we do a Western blot. And most of you are probably familiar with that. In the newer algorithm for the fourth generation, the Western blot's gone away. So we're moving away from actually doing Western blots, and we'll talk about Tests have been available for serum and oral fluid for a while. There was a urinary test available. I don't think that's still on the market. And the combination of the screening and confirming assays gives you accuracy over 99%. From a lab test standpoint, that's absolutely wonderful.